all the time. God is good. Are we running, Heather? I'm trying to check <laughs> Well, we're just checking to see if we're online yet. So, But it's so good to see all of you come out today. And what a beautiful day outside. The sun is shining. The wind's blowing just enough to make it nice. So we're on. You just goes right back down. <laughs> okay, we're going to do this again. God is good. All the time. All the time. God is good. Let's go to God in prayer. Dear Father, we just thank you for so many things. We each one could list a bunch of things you have done for each of us. We thank you for each person that's here today. Be with the ones who are not here, if they're traveling, if they're ill. Just be with those, Father, and let them know that you're holding them as well. Forgive us of our sins and guide us through this service that it be committed to you and not to any of us. In thy name we do pray. Amen. Let's all stand and we're going to sing Because He Lives. Mine too. <laughs> and those of you at home, sing with us.
seated. It's great to see everyone here this morning and online, though we can't see you, we know you're there. If you have any prayer requests from our online people, please put them in the comment section now so that we can get them in time of our prayer time. Also, if you're out there, and even if you don't have a prayer request, just sign in and say, hey, I'm here, so that we know you're there with us as well. Um, I think we have a couple of visitors this morning, and I'm going to put uh, Sonny on the, on the mark and let him stand up and introduce them. We are so glad to have you, and please come back again soon and bring that warm weather with you when you go. <laughs> okay, um, I have some morning thoughts, and, and it's just, just a couple of them. I was reading a, a devotion for today, and I didn't like the first part of it, but when I hit the second part, I thought, oh, wow, that hits me, because, you know, there are days I feel like that I'm not the age I am, and then there are days that I feel like I'm more than the age I am. You know, that old age, old age is not, you know, it's not as gold as we thought it was going to be, but this, this part of this devotion just hit me, and I wanted to share it with you and let you think about it. The Bible includes stories of people whose golden years brought some special ministry or reward. At age 90, Sarah gave birth to Isaac, those whom the Jewish through whom the Jewish people came. Miriam was around 90 when she helped her younger brothers, Moses and Aaron, lead the Israelites to the Promised Land. Elizabeth was well planned. Elizabeth was well past her childbearing age when she had John the Baptist, who prepared people for the Messiah's coming. Simeon and Anna, two elderly people at the temple, enjoyed the privilege of seeing and recognizing the promised Messiah when he was over just about a month old. In Isaiah 44, God promises to care for his people. If we walk closely with Jesus, we don't need to worry about what we've lost through aging. We can look forward to what he has in store for us. So don't long for the good old days. Instead, focus on your future with Jesus. Okay, um, we have the prayer service starting tonight at 6. It's really a, a neat thing. It's very casual, and the men, uh, pastor promises not to preach a long sermon. He just does a nice little talk for us. Really, it's very good. I'm just teasing. We, sometimes we do hymns. And it's just a nice hour spent in God's house on Sunday evening, which is maybe where we all should be. Also, the Bible study that has always been going on at Jared on Wednesday night at 6.30 will begin this week as well. It'll be a review of Genesis to start with, and then they will pick up where they stopped on the study and go forward from there. So if you've not gone, you're certainly welcome to come. And if you've been coming, you're certainly welcome to come back. So don't forget those things. Mark your calendar and know that they're on there for you to do. Our scripture this morning comes from Psalm 24. The earth is the Lord and everything in it. The world and all, we, all who live in it, for he founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. Who may ascend the hill of, hill of the Lord, who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to an idol or swear by what is false. He will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from God his Savior. Such is the generation of those who seek him who seek your face, O God of Jacob. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors, and the King of glory may come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Lift them up, O you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is he, the King of glory? The Lord Almighty. He is the King of glory. May this reading bless each one of you. And now it's time for Children's Church. Good morning! Good morning. Good morning. Okay, much much better. I guess I I have a little bit 
louder voice. Than that. I talk loud, but I want to tell you a story. A story about a boy named Thomas. No, not the Thomas I talked about a while ago with Downing Thomas. But coming up soon, we have uh, an event that we, they have it every four years. It's called the Summer Olympics. All these sports are participated in to get gold medals, silver medals, and bronze medals. Well, this little boy, Tommy, he loves sports. How many of us love sports? I mean, I love just about any sport. How many of you are good at sports? Oh, no hands went up. <laughs> well, Thomas, let me read this story about Thomas. Thomas was pretty bad at sports. He looked up from his book one day at school as his teacher announced to his class, it's time for recess, we're going to play softball. Jacob, you and Mary will be the team captains today. Oh no, Thomas thought to himself, if Jacob and Mary are choosing their teams, I'll probably be the last one chosen as usual. As he stood with the other children on the playground, Thomas tried to pretend it didn't bother him when the other children were chosen one by one and he was left behind. But the truth was, it really hurt his feelings. I wish just once I could be the first one chosen, Thomas whispered to himself. How many of us had that happen to us? You know, baseball, I was normally chosen. Football, because I was a big boy. Basketball, <laughs> I'm the last one left against that wall. I could not shoot. The basket could be right here, and I would miss. I still practice basketball with the uh, waste basket and paper, and maybe once out of every 20 tries, I'll get it in. But I, I really stunk. And so I know Thomas is feeling. He really feels bad when he's the last one chosen. But I want to talk about another one, another time that we are chosen. First Ephesians, uh, chapter, I mean, chapter 1, verse uh, 11 through 12. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in a conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we who were the first to put our hope in Christ might be the praise of his glory. What is stating there is we are chosen by God. We never have to worry about being the last one chosen because all of his children are chosen as long as they accept Jesus, his son, as, as their savior. And we will be chosen. He already knew even before we were born who all was going to follow Jesus. And he chose us and we never have to worry about being picked last as long as in our hearts we accept Jesus as our savior. So let us pray. Gracious and, Heavenly Father, Gracious and Heavenly Father, thank you for choosing us, choosing us. And, sending your son and sending your Son so that we can choose to be a part of your family. Help us to share this with others so they can be part of that family as well. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. Now, there's no children here, so no young children. We're all children. So we're going to do the same thing. Left side versus the right side. One, two, three. Have a great week! It's a tie. <laughs> we're all kids at heart, aren't we? Let's stand. We're going to do victory in Jesus. as soon as Mike gets back there and gets our words up. <laughs>
gonna swing this one back out of the way. No, you're fine. Good morning. Can you hear me okay? All right. Good to be here today. Good to see so many of you. This is uh, the most we've had on a regular Sunday in a while. Uh, good to see a lot of you. Good to see some of you back. Uh, Terry, has, where you've been uh, uh, having some uh, tough couple of weeks. Good to see you. And Jim, it's good to see you back there. Yeah. Glad to do it, man. Glad you're here. That's, uh, yeah. I was going to say, if, if somebody was gone the last Sunday or so and then saw you today, they'd have no idea. So That's it. You and Terry both, you guys look great. It's so good to see you. We're going to go to prayer here in just a minute. Um, what? Oh, Jeanette is here. We saw her a second ago. Good morning. Uh, it's so good to see so many of you. Uh, we're going to go to prayer here in just a minute. Uh, let me share with you the requests we already have. And then if you have others, we'll be uh, glad to add them there also. Uh, we're still remembering Sam and Barb and their various recoveries. So good to see you all, though. Uh, Heather's dad, Rick, uh, is still dealing with uh, the congestive heart issues and uh, a kidney disease that they found as well. So we want to remember him. Uh, Brandy, this says, uh, that's right, we had this new meds. Uh, so she started a new medication, is that right? Yeah. And continue to do what? Chemo. Okay. We want to continue to remember her. Also, Mike Burdett over the hill here. Uh, he's also dealing with uh, cancer and chemotherapy. Uh, Rob Jackson's brothers, we want to continue to remember both of them. Uh, his oldest brother's wife is now dealing with a cancer diagnosis, and the, the younger brother is uh, dealing with some other physical issues. Uh, the Skidmore's brother-in-law, Bill, they're trying a second bone marrow transplant with him because the first one did not take like they hoped. So we want to continue to remember him as well. Uh, I've got Larry Cottrell on here still. It's a friend of... Okay. Friend of Sam and Barb's. We'll remember him. Uh, I'm, is this your Debbie? Uh, with the... Uh, it's a friend of ours. Uh, she's uh, had, Her name's Debbie. She's having some back surgery. Uh, having... She's, she's her, it's her second one. We're putting rods in her back. Um, of course, Jim is here. So I'm glad to see you. Continue to pray everything is going well and continues to go well. Uh, we want to remember Pat. Uh, Pat Hardman. She's uh, having some, uh, just having a tough day today. Uh, couldn't be here today. Um, she did ask, and, and we will do that before the, in fact, we can do it here in just a minute. Um, if someone would, she asked if Doug would be anointed in her place. Uh, is if, if you'd like to do that, Doug, we'll be glad to do that here in just a second. We, uh, get, I'll share the rest of the list, and we'll anoint Doug on Pat's behalf, and then we'll pray. Uh, let's see. Now, this one I'm, I can't read. The two kids. Oh, Addie and Logan? Lincoln. That's the one I couldn't read. Addie and Lincoln, we'll remember them, and that is, uh, oh, they're sick, okay. Uh, Judy had cataract surgery, is recovering, but we want to pray for her, and uh, we'll continue to pray for Bob, we know he's been dealing with a lot of back issues and things, we we'll to keep him in our prayers as well. Um, are there others before we, I don't know. She did, she is home, um, that was on her foot, so well, let me add her. We want to remember her and her recovery. Robert, remember Terry. She's got a leukemia treatment. Okay. Can do that. I have another book request on the brand. Sure. Wow. 
That's awesome. Well, we'll, we'll thank God for that and continue to pray he recovers uh, even further. That's awesome. That's, prayer is a powerful thing, folks. Sometimes we forget that because we do it regularly or we do it out of routine. Prayer is a powerful thing. It truly makes a difference. Good. Good place to be, you know? Mm-hmm. Oh, I think we should pray for the day Okay. You can do that. Have we heard from them? Uh, yeah, now and again. They've, um, they've had a lot there. and They've been here, yeah. It's been a couple of weeks or so, but yeah. They, uh, and they do stay in contact. They've, they've had a lot. We want to remember them. Anybody else? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. That is. It's been tragic from the get go. So I remember everybody involved there. Anyone else? Sometimes we walk through what is the hardest thing we'll ever walk through. I, I can't imagine. But the amazing thing about what we see so much and what we know about what God does is that he comes and walks with us. And that makes all the difference. We can definitely continue to keep you in our prayers for sure. Anybody else? Any other unspoken requests? Let me just do it that way. Yeah, pull over. Lord knows our hearts for sure. Thankful for that too. Doug, will you come forward? We'll have prayer for Pat first, and then we'll pray over the request that have been lifted this morning. Even in this moment, to just 
put things back together that are out of line, or that the, whatever the problem is up in her shoulder, that she would just touch it, or that she would grab it and remove it and you would heal it. Lord, we ask that you would move in your power right now, Lord, that you would bless her with strength, that you would bless her with your presence this morning, and Lord, with your encouragement and your healing. Lord, we ask also that you pour those blessings on Doug also as he has come to stand in as well, Lord. Cover him with your spirit and your power as well. Lord, we lift them to you now, commit them totally into your care, and ask this in the matchless name of Jesus Christ, our healer. Lord, as we continue in prayer this morning, we, we thank you that you meet us powerfully. Lord, that you've given us promises in your word and, and given us lots to, to ground our foundations in, especially when the, the days get hard or the things we face are difficult. Lord, we know we can rely on you. Lord, we know that we can come in confidence and we can bring what seems like a long list. And Lord, to you, you welcome those needs. You welcome those requests, Lord, because you know that, that you can, we can trust you with those. Lord, we know there were many unspoken requests all over the church this morning, and Lord, for the needs that are on our hearts, we ask that you would just intend in those things as you see fit, Lord, as you see as most helpful. Lord, we know so many needs and so many burdens that people are carrying, and, and Lord, so many things that people understandably feel like they can't share. Lord, whatever those things are, we know that you know them. Lord, even when we feel like that we can't share them with other people, we know that we can share them fully with you in a way that we can't anywhere else. So, Lord, I ask for your blessing on those requests. Lord, we ask for your peace to go where it needs to be, for, for things to be restored where they are broken, to be healed where there is disease. Lord, for peace where there is anxiety. For any other need we may be carrying, Lord, we ask that you would meet it. Lord, we think of our list this morning for Sam and Barb. We, so good to see them today and ask that you continue to be with them. Lord, for Heather's dad, Rick, and the, the health maladies that he is dealing with, we ask for your healing there. Lord, for Brandy and for Mike, for Terry, or folks who are dealing with cancer treatments and chemotherapies and all those sorts of things, we lift them to you. Lord, we know that can just seem so difficult and so defeating, but Lord, we know nothing defeats you. And so Lord, we rest on your promise and ask that you would touch those folks who are dealing with that in particular. Send your healing grace to them and your, your strength and your encouragement this morning, we pray. Lord, we think of Rob's brothers and, and uh, again with his oldest brother's wife dealing with cancer as well. We ask that you be with her. And uh, extend your healing grace and your power to her also. And for the, the issues his younger brother is dealing with, Lord, that there could be a touch of your healing there as well. Lord, we think of Bill this morning. We know there were such high hopes for them. Uh, bone marrow transplant. And Lord, the first one didn't do like they hoped, but they're trying again. Lord, we pray that this would be the answer. We pray that you would work in this and work your healing through this. So Lord, at the end and... When the recovery comes, that people can say this definitely could not have happened without your hand, without your touch in it also. Lord, we think of Larry Cottrell and, and all that he is dealing with and ask for your touch and your strength, your healing on him as well. Lord, we know it's been a rough few weeks, but Lord, we ask for your continued presence there. Lord, we think of Debbie facing that back surgery coming up, and Lord, we know surgeries of all kinds can, can seem a little daunting. But Lord, we know that Psalm 121 tells us you watch over us all the time, from our going out and our coming in, and today and forever. And so, Lord, we, we trust that promise with these requests. We trust it for Debbie's surgery and ask that you be with her. Lord, it's so good to see Jim this morning. We're thankful that he's here. Lord, we ask that you would continue to touch him in his recovery. Lord, we are so thankful that he has bounced back as quickly as he has. Lord, it's so good to see him today. And we ask that you continue to bless him. And Lord, as we've already prayed for Pat, we would ask again that you would bless her this morning, and Doug as well, Lord, with just an extra measure of your power and presence today. 
or we think of uh, Ab Addie and Lincoln and uh, the virus they're dealing with. Lord, we ask that you would be with them also. Lord, we ask that you would drive that from them, flood them with your healing grace and your power this morning. Lord, we think of Judy and the cataract surgery that she is recovering from. Ask that you would help all of that recovery to go well and that the clarity of sight would be restored. Lord, we think of Bob and his back issues. And, Lord, we know that can just be incredibly debilitating. Lord, we know you're a God who hears and a God who heals. And so, Lord, we ask for your touch on him today also. Thank you that Kathy Elkin's surgery went well this week, but ask that you continue to be with her in her recovery as well. And uh, Lord, we think of this little boy, Isaac. Lord, we know children are so special to you. And uh, we thank you that even though things look like they might have been tragic, Lord, we know there was a turnaround and that, that prayers have made a difference here. Lord, we ask that you continue to be with him, help him to bounce back and help him to recover and uh, so that he can get on being the kid that you made him to be. When we think of the Dale family, and Lord, we know they've had a whole lot that they've been dealing with and, and uh, a lot of stuff of life with them. And Lord, we just ask that you would, you would bless them this morning in a powerful way. Lord, in a way that it is unmistakable that you have moved and that you have touched. Lord, encourage them, strengthen them this morning, and give them your peace and your presence right where they are. Lord, we think of the condo collapse in Florida, and Lord, all of the tragedy that that has been. And Lord, so much comfort is needed in so many ways that only you can give. Lord, strengthen those who are working in the recovery effort. Lord, comfort those who have lost friends and family members. And Lord, just surround that place with your arms because they need it so much today. Lord, thank you that Jeanette is back with us this morning. And Lord, we ask that you continue to, to walk closely with her day by day. Lord, I know it couldn't have been easy. I, I, I cannot imagine Lord, we know you've been there every step of the way and ask that you would continue to be as well. Lord, bless her. Give her your peace and your comfort also. Bless us in this service this morning, we pray. Be with me in the message. And Lord, remind us of just the, the magnitude of your grace today. We ask this in the name of Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. It is a good place to be this morning, amen? We are going to cover a lot of scripture today. I have th three passages for sure, and if something else strikes me in the middle, who knows? So we're going to start in Genesis. We're going to start in Genesis chapter 3. We'll jump in there in, in just a minute. We talked a couple of weeks ago about the storm that the disciples found themselves in, how the, the boat that they were in was rocked by the, the wind and the waves that they were not expecting. They turned around and found Jesus in the back of the boat asleep on a cushion. Uh, maybe when I'm napping through storms and stuff, I'm at my most Christ-like. I don't know. I, uh, you can ask Heather. I can sleep through about anything. Um, I slept through a car wreck once. So I was driving. <laughs> might, have, might have been the reason for the wreck, but I slept through a car wreck once. No, uh, but the, we know that the disciples found Jesus in the back of the boat. He was asleep, even in the middle of this storm, and they were worried that he didn't care. But of course, we know that he did care, and that he still does for each and every one of us, which is why we can bring a list of requests like this, and it might look huge and long to us, and God says, give that to me, which is amazing, which is kind of the amazingness of God's grace is sort of where all this is going to go today, eventually take us a minute to get there. I think the magnitude of that miracle of the storm is kind of the same as the magnitude of when we bring our storms and our stuff and give it to him, and that is that it's an act of God's love. You know, Jesus didn't need the boat to get to the other side of the lake. He chose the boat, chose to be with his disciples, knowing full well that storm was coming. It's an act of love, it's, and that when we bring those things to him, he knew we were going to run into those, but we we are recognizing who's in the boat with us and what an act of love that is. Sometimes I think that the, the magnitude of his grace coming to all of us can be easily missed because we have done church, at least for most of us, for many years. Some of us for all of our lives. I think I was eight days old when my mom brought me to my first church service. I mean, this has always been part of my reality. And sometimes it's, it's easy to sort of go, oh yeah, God's grace, and then go on because we just feel like we know it, we get it. 
But the magnitude is so big because people, for all of our striving, still need a Savior. We still look to this perfect God, and then sometimes we realize a little uncomfortably that there is, in fact, a really great divide between us and Him. Now, we know the answer to that gap is Jesus, but sometimes I think in order to capture the magnitude of the grace, we really need to look, at least for a minute, at just how big that divide is so that we can see just how much God has done for us. So we're going to start in Genesis chapter 3, starting uh, verse 1 in this passage. Um, for many reasons, for probably all of us, this is arguably the most difficult passage in all of the Bible. Genesis chapter 3. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And then they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree, and I ate. And the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. Let's pray for a minute. Lord, that is uncomfortable. And that is a tough place to begin. Lord, it is where we all begin. Lord, we're thankful that just as the Bible does not end in that passage, the sermon does not end at that passage. Lord, that your dealing with us did not end at that moment in the garden. Lord, show us your grace this morning. Show us the bridge that you have built for us. Remind us of the magnitude of this mercy, Lord, of who you are and who we are and how great your gift is. Lord, anoint this message that you would be glorified and magnified alone, and we ask it in the name of Christ. Amen. Years ago, many, well, it's many years for me. It was 20 years ago, approximately. I made my first trip ever to Colorado. I've been there several times since. It's some of the most striking scenery you've ever seen. I love the mountains in both places. West Virginia's mountains are just vastly different than Colorado's mountains. So I, I can't even really compare and say that one is more beautiful than the other, although I'd probably give the edge to West Virginia, not just because I live here. But the Rockies are, are stunning, and I really, really loved it. First time I was out there was for a church youth camp, because we were Nazarenes, and we were in Kansas, and Kansas's Nazarene teens all went to Colorado for camp. So we were out there, and it was the first time I ever saw the Rockies, and just was was mind blown about it. The second time I was on a ski trip with that same youth group. And if you want to see a divide like we're already starting to talk about, all you had to do was watch me try to ski versus watching a lot of the other kids in the youth group who could ski, and you could see some major differences. Um, I, I had a t-shirt from that trip. It was printed upside down on the back, and it said, if you can read this, pull me out of the snow. It was kind of my story of skiing, not, not a good time. But while we were on that ski trip, we were out there close to the Continental Divide, uh, which if you're familiar with the geography of the U.S., the Continental Divide is, is where rivers 
flow either east or west, depending on what side of the divide they are on. They're flowing toward the Atlantic or toward the Pacific. And if you drop a drop of water onto like the exact point of the divide, if it turns one way, it's going to run as far as it can until it meets up with another body of water or just runs out toward the Atlantic. And if it's just off to one side, just a fraction, it'll run the entire other direction. And I, th I think of that, and I'm reminded of, of people. Uh, I think I'm always reminded of people. Half the world's a sermon illustration, if you're me. But I think of that, and I'm reminded of people, because the drops of water, when they land on that divide, they all start in the same place. They all begin at the same spot. But they can all end up oceans apart. I think we as people, we as humanity, we started in an amazing place. That you know, Eden was everything that God wanted for us. It was beautiful, splendorous. It was the immediate presence of God like has never been experienced on earth in the same way since then. Like God could just in his fullness come walking through the garden and that was fine. And he doesn't do that now because of what we read. It would kill us. They stood there. They're in the, there's perfection. There's no separation in, the, in, the, in Eden, but humanity had a choice. They stood there on the divide looking at two ways to go. And if they had turned just a little one way and avoided the tree completely, then we wouldn't probably have all of the issues that we've had since then for the last eons of time. But if they turned a little the other way, which they did, which was the wrong direction, then we are now oceans apart from what God's original intent was when he put humanity on earth. The great divide was fixed between us and God. Sin had built this mountain of separation between us, and we were headed for the wrong ocean. And that's a tough place to be in. That's where we left the reading. That's a, was anybody else uncomfortable when we stopped right there? No, 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 that's a tough place, man. And if God had just left us there, then we'd have been a wreck. But the chapter doesn't end there. The conversation isn't over. Because God immediately goes to work on this divide. The first thing out of God's mouth is a curse on the serpent right after this conversation we've just had. But look very closely at what he says. This is verses 14 and 15 now. The Lord says to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. That's important. He shall crush your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Folks, that last verse is everything here. That's a fascinating verse. Do you realize what this is? Do you realize what this is saying? The Father has seen what has happened. He's seen, he's placed enmity between the snake and the woman and their offspring mutually. And we get the, the bruise, the heel, and crush the head thing. Knowing that the serpent is the devil, then you've got to know this. This is a prophecy of Christ. If you didn't know it, Jesus shows up in the third chapter of Genesis right here. He's the offspring of the woman that crushes the serpent's Head. The Father did not let us go ten verses from the time that the apple, or the fruit, whatever it was. We don't know that it was an apple. But the time that the fruit was eaten to right here. It's not even ten verses before he already says, okay, we are, there's a separation here, but I have a perfect plan to put this back together. The Son was going to be born for us, to become one of us, to provide a bridge that crosses this great divide. There's a, there's a wonderful theology word for this verse. Um, I'm going to tell you what it is. You don't have to, there's no quiz. But that, that last verse I read in here, verse 15, is called the Proto-Evangelion. That's your $10 theology word for the day. It's a big fancy word, but what that means, this is so much more important. If you forget that Greek, that's great, but this is what that word means. It means the first good news. Because chapter 3 has been a chapter full of bad news from the very... Now we have the first good news. The evangelion part of that is where we get evangelism. It's where we get 
gospel. It's that kind of good news. This is not like regular old oh, it's a sunny day good news. This is world changing good news. And God didn't let us go 10 verses from where humanity blew it entirely until he says, I'm building a bridge. There's good news. There's a way here now. I'm building a bridge because I still love you and you're still my children and I'm building it to get you back here. How amazing is that? I mean, is that not awesome? Because I mean, he wouldn't have had to do that. God is perfect. We are not, as is evidenced right here. And he could have just said, all right, you're cursed and you're cursed and I'll see you later. He didn't do that. The distance between who we are and who God is is massive, but it didn't stop God from wanting to bring us to where he is. And it didn't change the fact that there's still a huge divide both the sin thing and in the who we are, who he is thing. You only have to look as far as Job to see God's power demonstrated vividly in ways that we can't even really begin to get our heads around. Most of you probably know Job's story. He's had an incredibly hard run for the first 36, 37 chapters of the book of Job. He's lost his family. He's lost all his kids. He's left with a wife who says, curse God and die. It's the only quote we have from her in the whole book. That's encouraging. He's, he's, after all of this, he's left with these friends who give him really, really terrible advice. And Job forgets that there is a distance between who God is and who we are. Because Job starts out, understandably, asking questions of why this is happening. It's okay to ask questions like that. It's okay to wonder why. It's okay to take that to God. It's not okay to go one step farther, which is what Job did, and basically start to accuse God of things, like he's done something wrong. That's, that's not okay. And that's basically what Job's friends were doing and were telling Job to do. See, they had forgotten who God is in relation to us. And let me say to all of you and to me, as, just as quickly, we cannot ever forget who God is in relation to us. We are not him. He does not have a mind like ours. He does not work on a timeline like ours. He is not beholden to our whims and our wants. We can't manipulate him. He is totally different. Have you ever tried to manipulate God? Let me ask you that question a different way. Have you ever gone to God and said, Lord, if you do this, then I will do something? It doesn't work that way. You can't back God into a corner like that. It makes for some funny TV, but it doesn't work in real life. But that's sort of what's happening. That, that idea of kind of shoving God in the corner and making him do what you want him to do is kind of what had been happening in Job up to the point where I'm going to pick up, which is Job 38 for just a minute. There is this massive divide, and God reminds Job very quickly that there are vast differences between God and and people. If you want to see it, then that's where we're going. This is God's response to Job after Job's accusations. It's in Job 38. And God starts out the conversation vividly. I'm just going to pick up at chapter 38, verse 1. It says this, Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Dress for action like a man. I will question you, and you will make it known to me. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the lion upon it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? Or who shut in the sea with doors when it burst out from the womb? When I made clouds its garment and thick darkness its swaddling band and prescribed limits for it and set bars and doors and said, this far you shall come and no farther. And here shall your proud waves be stayed. Have you commanded the morning since your days began and caused the dawn to know its place that it might take hold of the skirts of the earth and the wicked be shaken out of it? You see how all this is shaping up? This goes on for all of this chapter, all of the next one, Job finally mutters about two verses worth of, I'm sorry, I won't say anything else. And then it goes on for a whole other chapter after that. And to, God tells Job in chapter 40 to gird his loins 
because God's going to ask him questions and he's going to answer. It's very similar to what he says here at the beginning. This goes on until chapter 42. That's four chapters of God laying out his massiveness and his greatness and his vast difference between me and you and them. We are the same and God is somewhere so far different. We're really no better than Job, by the way. So we, it's fun to look at Job and go, boy, he blew it. Well, yeah, but so have we. We're all in that human boat together. God is on a whole other level. This goes on to chapter 42, when Job is finally able to speak some repentance. But when you see these, these vivid pictures here, this incredible power and might and majesty as to who God is and how completely different he is than all of us, because unless any of us is drawing lines to tell the ocean where to stop or commanding sunrises and I don't know it, then we're all different than he is. It's a massive divide between us and God. But there's still a pattern here on God's part of reaching across that divide. Because after God lays out for four chapters just exactly how big the divide is, Job repents. And then Job prays for his friends, incidentally, who gave him the super bad advice at the beginning of this. It says the Lord's anger burned against his friends. You know what happens when the Lord's anger burns against people? They die most of the time. And so Job prays for his friends, and God's anger cools. So his friends live through this too. Job repents, he prays for his friends, and then God reaches across the divide and restores that relationship with him restores a lot of what he had lost. He gave him 10 more children. He gave him 140 more years of life. It says that Job saw four more generations of his family. There was the distance, there was the repentance, and there was the bridge to cross the great divide. See that? There was the sin in chapter 3 and then God building the bridge. There was the, the sin and the laying out here in Job and then the repentance and then the bridge and the great divide finds a crossing. We've seen the separation of sin and how that divides. We've seen how vastly different he is, which we must never forget. But it doesn't end even here. God wasn't satisfied with just sort of laying that out in Job and saying, here's how great I am and I'll reach for you and that's all you get. No, no, no. That offspring we talked about in Genesis is coming. That offspring is on the way. And when that happened, when Jesus came to walk the earth with us, he came into the divide to show us how to cross it. And now seeing all that we've read today, particularly that Job passage, and how massive the love and grace and mercy of God is to do that. I mean, he's commanding sunrises and holding back oceans, and he still wants to come and walk this dusty dirt as one of us with us. Folks, that's a huge bridge. That's one we could never build, but it's one that God built for us. The bridge finds its completion here. This is the Gospel of Matthew. Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, this man is calling Elijah. And one of them at once ran and took a sponge and filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. And the other said, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs also were opened, and many bodies of the saints that had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. When the centurion and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, Truly, this was the Son of God. Folks, that curtain in the temple separated the Holy of Holies from the rest of the temple. Most of you know that. The Holy of Holies was the place where the glory and presence of God dwelt in a physical way. Like his presence is in that room. It wasn't that he also wasn't everywhere else, because God is God and he hasn't changed. But he dwelt in a unique, powerful way 
in the Holy of Holies in the temple. This is a place where a priest could only go once a year on the Day of Atonement to sprinkle blood on an altar in there to atone for everybody else's sins for the year. And only one, only one could go in. And if he went in and he was somehow unclean or unworthy, he would die in an instant. It happened more than once. It happened often enough that when priests would go into the Holy of Holies in the temple, they would go in with a rope tied around one of their ankles that led to the other side of the curtain so that if they died while they were in there, they could retrieve them without also having someone else go in there. Because they would die too. It was that serious. That presence dwelt in there in a way that we could not access I mean, that curtain was absolutely the picture, a physical barrier of that great divide that we have been talking about. But now, with the death of Jesus, with the coming of the offspring, with this massive God that we read about in Job coming down as a person, wrapping himself in flesh and walking this dusty earth, dying in our place, that curtain is torn. The bridge has reached its completion. And folks, it's not just a bridge that crosses the great divide. It is the cross that bridges the great divide. This ultimate act of love and mercy at the cross, the division was closed. There was no longer distance. The relationship with God is now available through this ultimate, perfect sacrifice of Christ. And that divide of sin no longer has to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Folks, now it's as simple as the ask. The magnitude of that mercy is easy to forget, and we can't. We have to remember just how huge this is. Folks, what Jesus did for us is a gift that nothing else will remotely get close to. And that is accessible for each and every one of us all the time. Let me say this too. The bridge does not just bridge the divide of sin. He's helped to bridge the divide from anxiety to peace in a way that nothing else could. Or uncertainty to rest. Or from the world blowing us to and fro to having our feet on a sure foundation. The bridge from faith to fear. From hate to love. From death to life. From grief to joy. Folks, the cross bridges all of those divides in ways that could not be bridged by anything else. So I don't know what your need is today. We get a picture of just how massive that love and mercy of God is. Because listen, it doesn't mean it's, it's unapproachable. In fact, it means the exact opposite of that. God's mercy is so huge because, I mean, how many bridges did he build? over the years until he built the ultimate one with Christ so that we could all come to where he is. So I don't, I don't know all of your individual needs, but I know this. If you've got one and the divide between you and where you feel like you need to be with that thing seems like it's much too large, maybe it is for you. Maybe it is for me. But it's not for the cross that bridges the divide and the Savior who hung on it. Whatever your need is, Christ is big enough to bridge the great divide. I'm going to play for just a minute. The altar is open. If you need to come and pray about anything, you come. And if you need me, I will stop playing and come and pray. Believe me, I will will pray at the altar before I play the piano every day. And I'll play for a minute, and if you have a need, you come. He's here and the altar's open.
God's good, isn't he? All the time. He bridges those gaps we don't think we can cross. I'm, I am. And he's done it for me in a lot of small ways. He's done it for me in a few big ways. I'm sure not the only one he does it for. That's the best part. Because if he'll do it for me, he'll do it for anybody. And he's doing it up here for people this morning. Um, he's so good. It's been such a wonderful place to be this morning. We're going to have prayer service tonight. If you'd like to come and pray some more, we'll be here tonight at 6. Um, that's more of a kind of a guided prayer service we do together. Uh, I'll share... I will share some scripture. I'll probably share uh, just three or four minutes of, of thoughts on whatever scripture it is. I usually do that just standing down here in the front. It's a little less formal. Um, yeah, we do use a, an order of service pretty similar to the, the evening prayer one that's in the hymnal. Um, it'll have some guided prayers and some things we pray together and some scriptures we read. And it'll be nice. So if you'd like to come back out for that at 6 o'clock tonight, um, yeah. Come and join us. It's always good to get together in God's house anyway. Especially good to get together to pray. Do what? Oh yeah, Bible study, as we said earlier, starts Wednesday night, 6.30 down at Jarrett. And uh, that's combined, that's for everybody. We just hold Sunday night here and Wednesday night there. So please feel free to come. Um, we're going to pick up where we left off. Except that for the first Wednesday this week, um, and you guys might come just to watch me try to accomplish this, okay? I'm going to try to review the first, like, 47 chapters of Genesis in one meeting. Because that's about as far as we got. We're going we're gonna to buzz through a lot of reviews so that we can all catch up. So if you were not here, if you weren't coming to Bible study before, uh, come. It's going to be fun. It's a good time. And if you have been, come back. And if you missed this week and you still want to come... There's no homework, there's no workbook. It's like, come anytime. Because even if you haven't had what we've had in weeks prior, you'll be fine, you, you won't be lost. So come on out. 6.30 Wednesday for that, 6 o'clock tonight for the prayer service here. Anything else from anybody? So glad to see all of you. It's a wonderful day. Let's close. Now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in the knowledge of the love of God the Father and of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain in you always. Amen. Mm -hmm.